everyone. Hey, hey, how are we all doing? Are we all excited to get going? At we, got, we got a great talk for you. It's going to be fast now. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Dave. I'm Noel. And we're here to talk to you about uh, mathematics. Uh, mathematics, not just used for programming, but maths for a bit of fun and creativity as well. Right. But tell me, Dave. Though I can believe in a functional programming conference, uh, mathematics and programming go together. Tell me about mathematics and creativity. Mathematics sounds a bit dry and dusty. Creativity, you know, it's fun and exciting. What's the relationship here? Okay, so I'm sure you're thinking the same thing, right? And we got some great examples from Eugenia in the keynote about how maths and category theory can be applied to all walks of life. How can maths be applied to creativity? Well, it turns out that maths and creativity have kind of gone hand in hand since maths was a thing. So even in the days as early as the ancient Greeks, uh, where you know, a lot of founding work was done on mathematics, this guy is Pythagoras. I'm sure you know Pythagoras. Bit of a well-known mathematician. And as it turns out, Pythagoras is also known by many to be the father of theoretical music. It's kind of an interesting thing, right? So in this picture, Pythagoras is looking... At, well, we can't see it, but it's a book <laughs> of ratios. And ratios, it turns out, are really important for music. No? Right. So there's a story that goes about how uh, Pythagoras uncovered this relationship. And um, the story goes, he was walking past a blacksmith, and he noticed that when the area up at the top <laughs> is medieval drawing, the sort of typical apothecal of origin story that happens for a lot of these things, he noticed that there was a difference in pictures when the, when the blacksmith was striking the anvil with different sizes of hammers. And he looked at this relationship and worked out uh, the kind of fundamentals of what we now use in Western music. So we have an example of him here working on some kind of uh, string instrument, um, working some kind of woodwind, and doing that thing you use to annoy people in your family, mostly small children, where you make glasses, make that awful noise. Make them sing. Make them sing. Yeah. So... Um, Pythagoras basically uncovered that there's a relationship between the frequency of vibration that sound makes and the interval of a pitch on a keyboard. And we can demonstrate that for you right now. We have a tiny piano. Tiny piano. Yeah, tiny piano. Tiny piano. Yeah. Here's a tiny piano. You heard it earlier in the warm-up. And here it is. And so it totally turns out, if so I could hold this, yeah, thank you sure. very much, uh, that if I press a note on this keyboard, here is a middle C. Okay. And then I play another note, one octave above it. The ratio between those two notes of the frequencies of those notes is two to one. It doesn't matter what note I play, it's always the same, right? Up and down the keyboard. Now, the same is true for other common intervals that you may have heard, such as the fifth. So, oh, glad I got that right. Okay, so, so when you play a fifth, the ratio in the frequencies there is three to two. So the high note is three halves of the frequency of the lower note. And this goes on and on, right? So Pythagoras came up with all these different ratios, and this discovery, this linking, led to a lot of interesting work in number theory and a lot of interesting work in musical theory. So if you look back at sort of what the classical era, major classical era uh, academic achievements were, you'll see in many treatises music is listed up there alongside all the other areas that we know and love. Okay. Strongly. So we're going to be talking about maths, but I think we need to uh, really describe what we mean by, by maths before we get into that. So we'll start with the caveat, the hedge, in case have all trouble. We are not mathematicians. We are, at least not professionally mathematicians. We are engineers, physicists, computer scientists in some kind of ratio, which we won't describe. Um, but nonetheless, we have opinions on what maths is. And when we think of mathematics, what we're talking about really is not the kind of basic high school or primary school mathematics you possibly think of, like counting and numbers, arithmetic, that sort of stuff. And for us, mathematics is not uh, either equations, as Eugenia told us. They're all lies. Yeah, they're all lies. Don't believe them. Yeah. <laughs> or even proving things. And proving things is certainly a large part of the work that professional mathematicians do. Um, but that's not really what we think the true essence of mathematics is. For us, mathematics is really about structuring thought. So creating systems where we can reason about uh, ideas and being very precise about that. And one of the most important things in mathematics is abstraction. So let's talk a bit about abstraction through a concrete example. Yeah, Thank you, 
accidentally gave away my clicker. And yeah, I'm I know. Feeling I've got nothing in my hands. It's terrible. You gave me the power. So we're going to talk about abstraction, right? And we're going to do it via example. And the example we're going to use, like any good lecture theatre that we're in, is a, a, a question that many researchers would ask themselves. is how many students am I going to end up having to teach this term? We're going to get me away from my research. So uh, we're going to solve this question twice. We're going to do it once without maths and then once with. OK? OK? Yeah, I'm good. Cool. Right, OK. So we're going to solve the problem by, first of all, we list out all the departments in the university, right? And then what we would do is go around, uh, without ma using mathematics, we'd probably have to go around and we'd have to extract all of the students from these departments and bring them out to the central forum in the university and arrange them all side by side in a big group. That's and our answer. That's our answer, yeah. I mean, that's how many students we've got, right? It's absolutely precise. We can't get any more concise than that because we can't count them because we don't have maths. So we're lacking some kind of intuitive precision in our answer, but also we're kind of distracted. There's a bunch of weird, meaningless details here. Half of these guys are wearing sunglasses. Some of them are cats. Yeah. It's very surreal. What's going on there? So we're, we're blinded by unnecessary detail, and we're missing some kind of concise description of the end state. So what we'll do is we'll let the uh, students wander back to their departments, which is certainly good for some of them. Computing students in sunlight often don't go well together. So they can go back there, and they can get back to their work and doing what they were doing. And then we can go around, and using math, we can count them. And we get this for our numbers of students in each department. And then we can add up all of those numbers and get our final value, which is 36. In this case, we only have 36 students. Nice. A good, sure. small, focused yeah. university. It's a nice liberal arts college. I guess Jeremy would tell you that would be a lovely thing to have. <laughs> so um, this representation of the answer gives us all the same information that we need from the other representation. But it eliminates all of the noise, right? It eliminates all of the cats, all of the sunglasses, uh, and we just have a number here. So the key thing here is that numbers uh, are an abstraction, right? 36 on its own doesn't mean anything. It's just symbols on a page. Yeah. But 36 students, that's something that means something. And 36 uh, degree programs, that means something. 30, 36 students studiously working away on their work, that means something. Um, and abstractions here are allowing us to find uh, important properties. So here we're talking about counting, so we're thinking about just the parts of counting that we care about, and we're ignoring all the irrelevant details. All right. And so there's another abstraction that we used here, which we are so familiar with, we probably didn't even realize we were using it, which is this idea of adding, of course. Excuse me for a sec. So adding itself is an abstraction. You know, one plus one doesn't mean anything other than two, which is, again, just this abstract idea. But when we add, say, students together, we get a course, we add studying together, perhaps we get a, a pass. <laughs> I mean, we can do things that are maybe less well-defined. Adding, it gets a bit messy. Can you scroll me off? So, <laughs> any students a bit, maybe it gets a little bit messy. And it's this property of adding that we used, that we relied upon, to arrive at our final answer. So there's some structure here of adding which allows us to do this operation and know that we're actually going to get the correct answer. And we'll return to that later. What we want to talk about now, though, is how we can use abstractions. So there are various ways that we can, that we can work with abstractions. What we've seen so far is making an, an abstraction. So removing irrelevant details. We went from students and counting. And we made this abstraction up to this world of just numbers and where we're using addition. Right, so that's so making abstraction, abstracting up. The other thing we can do is we can transfer these abstractions to transfer across grounded domains. So we could take this idea of, we saw students counting took us to numbers in addition, and maybe we can take this idea of number in addition and ground it in some different domain. And this is where we're going to bring the creativity into it. So let's see what we can do in some other domain. And so we'll start with something fun. Yeah, well, what else can we add? Let's think about images, pictures, right? So when I think about uh, adding images, I'm sure many of you will think the same thing. I think about tiling systems, right? So I could maybe add images by maybe taking them and arranging them horizontally or arranging them vertically and producing larger images from this, OK? So let's apply this. I can take some squares. I can arrange them horizontally, 
it makes this nice pattern. And if I then arrange that pattern vertically, but uh, I have a chessboard, or in this case, a nice tiled floor. Okay. And the, the kind of cool thing about this is I can change small properties of uh, my model, like maybe just change the base image, and I can get very different results, right? So I'm still doing exactly the same process, but I've just changed one small part, in this case, the tile I start with, and I get uh, new properties, like you can see these little cross shapes appearing between the tiles here. This is an emergent property of the design, and we, we, we may have just put that tile together and not thought about it. So, so the kind of general idea here is we have made an abstraction by designing a drawing system. We're, going, we're, we're drawing by always choosing base images and always arranging them. And that is, in this case, a restrictive system. We're not going to be able to produce every image this, this way, but it allows us to explore uh, different things we can do with tiling systems. All right. You've hopefully seen uh, some of these tilings around Cadiz. If you've walked around, you've seen them in the, the, most of the entranceways to buildings. So there's quite a lot we can do here. And we can take it into a, another domain. So if you're thinking of tiles and you're Dave, then you would immediately think of, say, tiling. Video games. Yes, video games. Video and games. There's a video game. Uh, does anyone recognize this video game? I do, because I've had to sit through the talk. For you had to sit through the talk for. This is, this is the tile set from the original Legend of Zelda game, right? So this is one of the first, this is, very, this is in the 80s, so this is when, back when games were little more than a couple of spaceships flying around on a static screen. And the, the impressive thing about this, this is 144 tiles of, of scenery tiles, and with that, they made this big persistent world. Okay, all right, by today's graphical standards, perhaps not so inspiring, but you've got forests, you've got dungeons, you've got all this kind of stuff. So having a tile set enables the designers to quickly experiment and try different, um, try different arrangements and try different level layouts. Uh, what more, what is, is also interesting is uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System had, guess how many kilobytes of memory? 640K is enough for anyone. Two. Yeah. Two kilobytes of memory. And you could expand it by a further eight in the cartridge that you put into it. So, like, this is kind of necessary, this kind of representation, to even make the thing work, but it's also a great creative tool. So, um, let's uh, now look. We've seen some applications of abstraction over pictures. Let's look at another thing, fun sounds. Right. So, sound is a, a great sort of example. What we're going to be looking at here, in particular, is oscillators, um, so basic of synthesizers. So, um, synthesizing... I'd say it's all about not. Yeah. yeah. It's all about knob twiddling, you might say, as the picture <laughs> indicates. And the, the basic building block of your synthesizer is the sine wave, which you've probably seen before. So you, if you sort of trace the sine wave across and you look at where your finger is as it's going up and down, and you have that same pattern on a um, speaker, then you will have a <coughs> sine wave. And if I press the correct button, hopefully. Oh, that's loud. Look at that. Wait for the next one. Oh, my God. <laughs> Should we turn so, it down a bit? Or are we... uh, it's, it's, it's cool. You can cope with it, can't you? Yeah. Um, so that's a very mellow sound, right? It's very simple. It's very pure. And it's also the basis of all the other noises that synths make. So we can, we can build other types of synthesizers by adding sine waves. So here's an example, a sawtooth. Um, so we'll show you what it sounds like in a minute. But basically, you make a sawtooth wave by taking some fundamental sine wave and then adding harmonics to it. So this is my bass sine wave, which is whatever I get when I just press a note, and if I add a second harmonic, which is twice the frequency and half the amplitude, twice as wibbly, half, half the, the height, uh, then I, you can see the shape starts to change, and if I keep adding harmonics on, third, fourth, and let's say we add the first hundred harmonics together, you need a lot, you end up with a very, very different type of shape, and this is the one that's going to blow your ears off. You ready? There we go. Oh, that's so that <laughs> noise is completely different, right? It's, 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 very, it's, it's very thin, fuzzy. it's mm. nasty, um, and it makes a really good sort of synth bass now. Yeah, if some acid bass, you might want to have that. And we can do that again um, for a square wave, another type of wave we can produce. For a square wave, we just add the odd harmonics. So I've missed out two and four and six. We just add the odd ones together, and... You get this. Okay, so that's like a very hollow noise. It's kind of like very chip tune very lead sound. Um, and so just by changing, uh, just by uh, recombining the sine waves in different orders, we get all this variety. So again, we can explore in this scenario, right? So your synth manufacturer will ship synthesizers that have got all these weird and wonderful waveforms, and you as a user can start playing with them. So one common thing that people do is, is detune things. You take 
whatever synths you're playing, you duplicate it, and you just make one of them slightly to a low, slightly lower frequency, and you get this beating noise. And that sort of helps kind of lift it out of a mix a bit, and you know, gives you a bit of motion, a bit of interest, where you would have otherwise had a fairly boring sound. So lots of room to play around. So what we're seeing here is that abstractions inspire creativity. They give us a, a well-defined space in which we can explore. And they make it easier than exploring uh, possibilities when you have no restrictions. So for example, if you had the task of designing a mysterious forest and you were given no other constraints, there, there are many ways you could go. You know, it could be like a sort of a, a visual image, it could be a stage set, it could be black and white, it could be realistic, it could be kind of some kind of stylized thing. And there's so many directions that you could go in that it's difficult to narrow it down to one particular idea. Whereas if you're working, say, with the Zelda tile set, then you might come up with something like this. <coughs> and because you have a, a much uh, more limited range of things you can achieve, you're likely to get to something that's usable quite quickly, and then you can um, get on to perhaps other things. Or if you want to spend some time exploring, you can also explore much more rapidly because the way you can combine these things is a lot faster than say, building different types of realizations out. It's all about iterating and shipping, shipping things quickly. Yeah. Similarly, like, if we, if we had a cool band, right, and we wanted to put down a synth riff under whatever we had recorded, we're much more likely to be able to use something like this, which is basically just choose a preset and go, than we are using this telephone exchange, which is much more powerful, but much harder to use. I think it's actually the first thing to run Erlang. That was Joe Armstrong's psychedelic days. <laughs> Okay, so, all right, all right. we've talked about um, uh, this stuff for, for creativity, but the talk is also about programming. So what we want to do is take the idea of abstraction and see how it applies back to programming. So we're going to re-ask, what yeah. can we add, but this time in code, okay? Right. Um, and the answer is... Lots of things, really. Um, here's some of the things we thought we could add. You know, we've seen some of them before, pictures and oscillators. Uh, numbers, we can add them, like numbers. Strings, we can concatenate them. Lists and sets, so sets be set of set union and, and list concatenation. And then we got one here, which is a bit of a different one. HTTP root, we think of a sort of a root from going, it's like a partial function from some kind of request to response. Adding them could mean trying them in sequence, in sequence which they're added. Does this root match the request? If it does, then get its response. Otherwise, move on to the next one that we've added onto this um, sequence. <coughs> so we're kind of we're defining the semantics for what addition means. But there's a common pattern for all of this. And the pattern is the, 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 the common or garden monoid, right? So, you know, mathematicians like to give silly names to very simple concepts. Monoid is the name given to a very simple concept of addition. And three things do we need for a monoid. Uh, first one is some stuff to add. So in this case, integers. If we're doing this in something like Scala, we just use a type. Then we need an addition operator, and then we need some empty value, something that we can start adding from if we were going from zero, literally, in this case. Yeah. And the great thing about programming languages is not only can we ground our grounded abstractions, but we can also represent the abstract abstraction, if you like, in the language directly. So if we're using Scala, we could represent a monoid using, say, this type class implemented as a trait. Similar thing in Haskell, slightly different machinery, but it gets the same endpoint. And you see the monoid has these elements. So the type A is the, um, the type. Yep. The values we're adding. The combine is the plus operation, and we have our empty element here. And then we can go on and implement various instances of, of this monoid for a particular type. So here it is for integers, and it does what we would expect. We're just adding the numbers together, and the empty element is zero. But we could do this for whatever. We could do it for the images. We could do it for the oscillators. You just have to build some kind of representation. And um, what that gives us is a bunch of uh, common interfaces. So here's, this example is using, um, there's two main functional programming libraries in Scala, CATS and Scala Z. They're more or less the same kind of thing. And both of them, once you have your monoid, they both give you that trait monoid. Once you've implemented your monoid, you can use this fancy bar plus bar operator to add things. So you can add integers. You can add strings. You can add anything that has a monoid instance. If I'd written a monoid for pictures, I could make this a uh, statement about programming and copy. Uh, I can even write generic code. So this is a function that says, I can add together three things of, any, of some type A. It doesn't matter what A is, but it says, look, you've got to have a monoid for this. 
And because you said you've got to have a monoid for this, then we can use this bar plus bar. And it's just sort of something that the compiler checks for us. So um, this is all, these are all examples of stretching into different domains. And it goes further and further and further. Right. So a few other domains in which we can make this type of abstraction. Um, if we look at what are known as commutative replicated data types, CRDTs, they're, a, they're data types for handling eventual consistency. So the, the big idea here is you have a bunch of machines which are receiving messages and updating some sort of state, and then periodically they're going to communicate and reconcile um, the, the differences in their state that they have that has occurred as they've been receiving these messages. And we want to do this without conflict, without like the equivalent of a sort of git merge happening. Everything just merges straightforward. And if you have a CRDT, then you can do this. And at the core of one class of CRDTs are monoids, commutative idempotent monoids, in fact. Because, of course, we love fancy words for simple more ideas. It's more fancy. Yeah. And that's a, a really nice thing if you're working in distributed systems. Um, if you're working in sort of the big data world, then you might be interested in some of these streaming algorithms or approximate data structures, which are, I find really fun. The idea here is you want to find out some properties of a possibly infinite data stream. Um, you only want to visit every element once. It's quite hard to visit an infinite stream more than once. Um, so you might want to say, what are the most common items in this stream? What is the, the number of distinct items? And you can work these things out with bounded memory and have an, appro with an approximate answer. So you give up a little bit of accuracy to gain a lot of um, memory usage, or reduce memory usage a lot. And these systems are all monoids again. I mean, you can work, do work in parallel and add them together. Yeah. So it's very useful in systems, sort of MapReduce style, or other kind of parallel systems where performance is concerned. Yeah, so we, we see the, you know, the same pattern. This, this is, it appears everywhere, right? It appears all over the place. It's very flexible. But we've only kind of told you about half the picture, because we said you needed three things for a monoid, but that's not true. You also need it to be a well-behaved monoid, <laughs> not a yeah. naughty monoid. Yeah. So uh, for that we need for that we need laws, right? And laws are just basically rules that our implementation has to follow. So the, the rules of the monoid are super easy, right? One of them is called the identity law. So that just says if I add this zero element to any other element, it doesn't change the other element. So zero plus one is one. It's not you know one and a half or something. Um, and you can see that that would hold for our images. Um, all right. This, by the way, this dot here represents a zero by zero pixel image. That's our empty value for image. Um, we drew the empty alignment. image. <laughs> we drew the empty image, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and then, you know, for sine waves, we could have, like, maybe an oscillator that has no amplitude. That, if we add it onto anything else, wouldn't change it. So we can, we can see that both of our use cases here obey this law. The other law is associativity, as we saw earlier, which is basically like you can put the brackets in any, in any place and you get the same result. So with images, you can see that it doesn't matter how you group them, you get the same result with this horizontal alignment. The same is true, obviously, for vertical alignment. And take it from me, the same is true for the waveforms. You don't have a demo of it, but it's just mixing stuff, right? So it doesn't matter what order you mix it in. Um, now, the interesting thing about these laws is these are the laws that allowed us to do our addition at the beginning. So remember, when we counted the students, we counted them in the departments. So we got all these individual numbers here. And then we added the numbers together. So we can do this stuff in stages. But it, we, know, we know intuitively it's just the same as just counting them all in one go. And it's only because we have well-defined laws in our abstraction that we, could, that we could do this, that we could reason in this way. It seems trivial to us because add, adding is so simple for us. But... Uh, it's true nonetheless. So, the other thing that laws are really useful is for composing abstractions. So, yeah. So let's take an example. Um, let's say we have monoids and sequences, and we see what we did there. It's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> we want to combine them in some way. So we're going to be a little bit informal about what a sequence is. Um, we'll just say a sequence will be something that has a fold left and a fold right operation. Um, hopefully, you've had a little bit of familiarity with those. But once we have the, that and a monoid, then we know we can implement a function like this combine all, which says take the, all the elements in the sequence and add them together with the monoid instance. So here we're adding together some numbers, getting a result 15. It doesn't matter what order we add them in, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we haven't said here whether we're adding left to right, right to left, or maybe that, that notion that left and right don't even make sense for our sequence. Um, it doesn't matter because we have associativity that we're relying on that lets us 
get a result. Um, another thing uh, we can do is implement something called fold map, which is like combine all we just saw, but first we're mapping or transforming the elements and then we're adding them together. So here we transform numbers into strings and then we add together all these strings, which is string concatenation, and we get one, two, three, four, five. And this type of thing is really the very core of MapReduce. Um, and yeah, that's basically all that you know, Hadoop and that kind of stuff we're doing. So the, the other cool thing about fold map is remember with the synthesizers, you need like to add together 100 sine waves to produce a sawtooth wave. You obviously don't want to write that out by hand, but you can write 1 to 100 for every one generate sine wave you need and then have them all composed together. Yeah. But a simple descriptive kind of uh, definition of a sawtooth wave. It's quite a powerful system. Okay, so let's recap what we've done so far, the story so far. So I hope we have demonstrated that abstractions are useful creative thinking. We have seen how we can take abstractions across domains and use them to inspire uh, systems that we can then explore to produce creative results. We've seen that with our tilings and our, our synthesizers. Um, abstractions are useful for, for solving problems. So we saw how we could solve the counting problem in the department by using this abstraction of numbers, which is so familiar to us, we probably don't even think of it as being an abstraction, but it definitely is. And then we've given some small sort of code snippets of, of other things that you could do, the CRDTs, MapReduce, and so on. We've hinted um, at this huge ocean of other, other additions, things that you can yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing we've seen is that we can combine abstractions so long as there are some laws that tell us what we can ex how we can expect the abstractions to behave. So those laws, like the law of associativity, that we leverage um, in parallel systems to say it doesn't matter in what order or where we put the brackets, in what order we do the reduction, we'll get the same result. So we, we need to have these laws to enable us to make this, this composition. Now, what we thought we'd do is we'd like to repeat the process, but in a domain that is completely different. So you know, adding is really quite simple, quite familiar. It feels very kind of mathy. So let's go to something that's a little bit more pragmatic, a little bit more reactive, a little bit more domain-driven design. And we're, of course, talking about event sourcing. Event sourcing, sourcing right? The most creative thing uh, that we could think of. So uh, who's using events, event sourcing somewhere? OK. Who's written a Redux application? A few more hands should go up. It's the same thing, right? So the idea of event sourcing is we model an application as just a big stream of events. So you've got like some state of your application at the moment, and then you, you uh, are reading in events. So here we're reading in a stream from left to right. And you have a reducer, right? So you have a function which consumes the state and event and produces the next state. And you sort of munch through the events, and you end up with the most updated state, OK? So we are going to apply that to sort of creativity. Um, and uh, First, oh, yeah, here? sorry, it is. It's just folding. Lettering on the secret. Event yeah. sourcing. It's just folds. <laughs> it's just folds. Um, we're going to apply this to uh, the field of creativity. Something and so we're grounded. Trying to think of something, yes, a bit more grounded. How, how more grounded can you get uh, than these little fellas? <laughs> little turtles. Yeah, very close to the ground. So um, turtles are delightful creatures that uh, uh, chomp on leaves, uh, and they are also sort of a cursor-based drawing system. So I'm, I'm assuming everyone here has seen Logo at some point. The idea is you take a, uh, a cursor like this and you feed it a sequence of commands. Move forwards, turn right. My, my thing has stopped. There we go. And by secret, feeding it a sequence of commands, you draw a shape. It chomps okay. its way through the commands and we get something on the screen. Oh, oh the nom nom. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Oh, that's the spoiler. So the, the, then the way we're going to apply these is through these thing, into these things called Lindemeyer systems, which is, gives us room to cre um, be creative. So these are more commonly known as L systems. Um, so let's talk about L systems. Do you want to okay, yeah. do a 101 on L systems? Okay. So L systems were created by a guy called something like Asterid. I think it's Aristide Lindemeyer. Aristide Lindemeyer. Does anyone know? No. No, okay, great. Anyway, uh, a biologist and botanist, right? Yeah. So he was interested in modeling the growth of natural processes. So he came up with this, I this idea, this full system for modeling it. And it consists of the um, following things the alphabet, which are some symbols you can use, your axiom, which is just your starting symbol. I always find the kind of terminology in your systems a little bit goofy. And the production rules, which basically say, 
When you see one of the symbols on the left, replace it with the symbols on the right. This is saying, if you see an A, replace it with an A and a B. If you see a B, replace it with an A. So we start with an A, and then we look, OK, what rules can we use? Our first rule, A, replace with A and B, and we end up with A and B. Now we have an A and a B. These two rules match. We do the replacement, and we end up with A, B, A. Uh, do it again. We get more oh, the green and the yellow look the same, but anyway, the idea yeah. is. So, so the idea is we can use this to model sort of generational growth in something. You know, n is naught; it's just a little tiny colony of algae. Yeah. N is seven; it's a huge colony of algae. Yeah. But we can also use it to create successively more interesting programs for our turtle. So, let's apply uh, L systems to turtles. So, this is our alphabet. Commands to say move forward ten centimeters, turn left ninety degrees, turn right ninety degrees. And we'll start with a program that just moves forward. And we'll start with just an example that has one crazy production rule. And you'll see what that does in a minute. Like. It's not the economy cheat code, though it looks like it. <laughs> AB, AB. Yeah. Um, so our initial um, program is pretty boring. It just moves forwards. But if we go and elaborate this with a production rule, we replace this symbol with all of these, we get a program that does something a little bit more interesting. right? And if we go to the next generation, we replace each one of these with the whole program. So we end up with the whole program, then turn left, and the whole program, then, to, then turn right, and so on. We end up with something that looks like this. And we do it again. And we do it again. And we end up, this thing is called a, a, a Koch curve, um, yeah. named after this mathematician, Koch. So uh, it's a fractal curve. The, idea, the, the, the reason we're showing you this is we, got it, we started with a completely different abstraction, right? And we got a totally different type of image. And this would be very, very difficult to produce with, with tiled systems. Well, maybe not so difficult because they're all square, but you wouldn't get the inspiration to produce this, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, necessarily come to, oh, I'm going to make this kind of uh, pattern. The other thing we could do with this is we can explore, again, by changing parameters within the system. Right, so let's take the um, system we originally started with. And we're going to change the way that turning works here so that instead of turning 90 degrees, we're going to turn 60 degrees this time. But otherwise, we're leaving the uh, system unchanged. So we start with our forward line. We replace it with our first production rule. We get this. We expand it. We get this. It goes on and on. It becomes more elaborate. And we get what I believe is the cot snowflake. And if we get a few of these and stick them together, we get this kind of very pretty fractal shape. And again, this is something that we couldn't easily achieve with our tiling system, but something that's quite within quite easy reach with an L system. So we've seen how the different abstractions make certain things easier to uh, find. And we're also kind of seeing very different shapes even within the L system. It's like this looks really different to the previous thing, right? Yeah. Well, let's take that even further. Let's, let's be kind of creative. Let's, people have done crazy things with L systems. Here's a program which has two commands for moving forwards. They both move forwards the same. They're exactly the same at an implementation level, but they expand differently. And this, you see, this, this sort of normal arrow does all of this stuff, and then this triangular arrow just kind of doubles each time, so you get this idea that maybe the picture doubles. And this is a Sipinski triangle. So although these are drawn the same shape, uh, same size, really this one is twice the size of this one, and this one's twice the size of this one, so you get this kind of increasing effect. And it's kind of, it's kind of crazy, the complexity, right? Um, here's one more example for you. Um, this one... The green star and yellow star don't make the turtle do anything. It just stays there. But they control the expansion. So this one involves green star means sort of turn left a bit. Yellow star means turn right a bit. And they're kind of like mirrors of one another. And with that, you get this thing called a dragon curve, which is a sort of a nice spirally pattern. And dragon curves bring us right the way back to video games because <laughs> they're used as the basis for creating interesting foliage in, in, in a lot of graphic systems. So, you know, try making this with a square tiling system. It's going to be oh, hard. Especially because the squares are 2D and this is 3D. Okay. Um, so we're on, the, we're on the home stretch now, right? We're almost yeah. there. We've got one more thing to cover, which is really just uh, talking about this um, notion of choosing abstractions. And that's this, the idea of power of an abstraction. So if you hear mathematicians talk about the power of an abstraction, they mean something very specific. They mean how many programs or states can this abstraction produce, right? So you get the idea that like, maybe one abstraction is strictly more powerful than another because it can do more, it can represent more. But we've also got this idea we're going to call creative power, which is like how convenient is it to do this? 
So if we were to take like our rectangular tiling system and apply it even to something which is another tiled image, but maybe one that's on a triangular base, we're going to have a hell of a job uh, work making that work. Although the fact that we're showing you this on a pixel-based display shows you we can make it work. Um, and you know, other types of image, I'll skip past this, but we've got you know, reflecting images and kaleidoscopes, trees, L systems, and so on. We come to the end of the talk. And in summary, we've talked about maths. We've talked about math being abstractions. Abstractions are important. They're important uh, because they help us focus on what's, it, what's uh, crucial to solving a problem. We've seen how abstractions impose restrictions. We've seen how restrictions help simplify our understanding of a problem so we can solve it more easily. We've also seen how they can inspire us to uh, uh, you know, play within a system, play around with a system, and, and do different things. And uh, we... But we've also seen that you've got to choose your abstractions carefully. So maybe after a while of playing with one abstraction, you exhaust all the options and you have to move on to another one. That's okay. We've seen that abstractions should be simple and lawful because otherwise they become hard to reason about and compose. And there's, there's more about that really in the keynote this morning. Um, so, you know, please go ahead, find these mathematical abstractions, follow the, the paths of our ancestors, and uh, let's do some creative stuff and kind of create a trajectory into the future where mass programming and creativity are all sort of fused into one inevitable, beautiful whole. Pure awesomeness, yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>